Good morning and welcome to this, the 14th meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee in 2018. Can I make the usual request that um, mobile devices are switched onto airplane mode or mobile phones are off the table? Um, agenda item one this morning is the continuation of our human rights in the Scottish Parliament inquiry. And we have two panels of witnesses this morning. But first with us this morning is Angela Constance, who is the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities. And she is supported this morning by Duncan Isles, who is the Head of Human Rights Policy, and Marissa Strutt, who is a Human Rights Policy Advisor at the Scottish Government. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and welcome back uh, to committee. You will understand uh, that this is an incredibly important um, piece of work that we are undertaking right Right now, and, and we're really keen to hear from you this morning on the government's position on many of the areas that we've been pursuing on the committee. I believe you've got a brief opening statement. Um, uh, yes, convener, just yep. a few words by, yep, by way of uh, opening. And uh, thank you very yes. much, convener, yes. and uh, good morning uh, to committee members. Um, as you know, the Scottish Government has a long standing record of commitment uh, to human rights. Uh, in Scotland, we uh, are all entitled to enjoy extensive human rights safeguards delivered by a, a sophisticated framework uh, of national legislation and international treaty obligations. And those safeguards include the familiar statutory protections delivered by the Scotland Act, the Human Rights Act uh, and the Equality Act. Uh, they include the vitally important guarantees which are delivered by EU law and the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, guarantees which, as we know, uh, are under threat as a result of Brexit. They also include the fundamental human rights uh, identified in the, the much larger body of international treaty commitments uh, which apply in Scotland also. And those obligations are real and those obligations are substantive. And as the ministerial code makes clear, at least in the, the Scottish version anyway, we have a, an overarching duty to comply with the law, uh, including international law and treaty obligations. So, in key respects, uh, the choice we have is not whether to secure the rights set out in the treaties which apply in Scotland. Instead, the question is, is how, how to do so in a way that works, uh, in a way that reliably uh, delivers for individual right holders and communities across the whole of our society, including those who suffer disadvantage and are at risk of discrimination. That question of how to implement human rights in ways that really matters is central to work not only of government uh, but also to this parliament. And I know, convener, you're looking very closely at how parliamentary processes can best support that work and there are obvious similarities with the, the challenges faced by government. So, for example, effective human rights training and a commitment to continuing professional development uh, is important to uh, both institutions. And human rights is core business and it's the job of everyone in the Scottish Government to help ensure uh, we are meeting our obligations. In fact, public officials not only need to know about human rights, they also have to be empowered uh, to respond proactively when human rights issues uh, do arise. And if we are to take a human rights approach, it is also essential that we do more than just predict how laws and policies will deliver human rights outcomes. Uh, but we need to also be able to check that those policies and laws are actually delivering uh, and that they are doing so uh, for every member of society. It also requires a commitment to meaningful and deliberative participation. Uh, that is about much more than one-off events. Human rights cannot, by definition, be safeguarded or advanced without the active participation uh, of rights holders themselves. And one of Scotland's uh, particular strengths, I believe, is, of course, the role played uh, by civil society. I know that you've heard from a, a cross range uh, of very able and articulative uh, representatives as uh, part of your ongoing inquiry. And for our part, the Scottish Government is keen not only to ensure civil society voices are heard at a, a domestic level, uh, the ability to present civil society views to best effect at international level uh, adds directly to the, the, the value of formal uh, scrutiny processes both uh, at the UN and the Council of Europe. The better place we are all to engage effectively with such mechanisms uh, the greater benefit we will have in shaping our own uh, Scotland-specific deliberations. 
The Scottish Government, I believe, has been leading the way uh, in this front. Uh, and we're keen to go beyond the inevitable constraints imposed by the fact that it is the UK rather than Scotland, which is a member state and reports at an international level. And to address that and to promote a, a fuller understanding of Scotland's distinctive position, uh, we have sought to publish, uh, whenever possible, freestanding Scottish position statements uh, ahead of each treaty examination. And the most recent to appear uh, covered our obligations under CEDAW, the Convention uh, for the Elimination of All Discrimination Against Women, and that was published uh, last week. And we expect the formal examination to take place uh, later this year. Convener, as I uh, indicated when I gave evidence on the Universal Periodic Review in January, uh, there is certainly scope for the, the Scottish Parliament to use human rights mechanisms of this kind uh, as an important framework uh, within which to develop its own uh, scrutiny work. And it is certainly my view that this Parliament has a pivotal role uh, to play in ensuring that we both uh, use uh, national and international human rights frameworks to the very best possible effect, and also to use them as a way to find common ground, uh, to construct solutions and to make a real life difference to the everyday lived experience uh, of all members of our society. So I very much look forward to uh, reading to and responding to uh, committee's deliberations in due course. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and um, a really detailed um, opening statement. But we have many areas that we would like to interrogate further with you, and I'm going to kick off this morning with Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Cabinet Secretary, thank you for coming along once again. Um, we've had um, a lot of evidence sessions on this now, and um, every single session has thrown up something different, and it's all been absolutely excellent, as well as the written evidence that we've received as well. Um, and we've also done breakout groups um, in Leith, and I was in Inverness, and again, you know, speaking to people with lived experience um, of disabilities and mental health issues was uh, quite an eye-opener. We also did a, a bit of a straw poll between all of us with our constituents and asked them, what do you believe human rights is? And we all agreed that a lot of our constituents feel that human rights is something that happens to other people or something that applies to other people in maybe a judicial sense or an immigration sense. So how do we embed human rights in society as a whole? Because as you said, we have a pivotal role here to play, not just within this committee, but within the parliament as a whole. So how do we get that message out there? Thank you very much. I think that's a great uh, opening question. Um, the, the bottom line is that human rights are for everyone. We can't be selective about uh, who human rights are available to. Uh, they're part of um, our rights as individuals and they're part of our collective rights um, as, as, a, as communities of interest and as a, a society. Um, I think the, the language around human rights is very important. Uh, I know you've heard lots of evidence about people um, they, they need to more routinely uh, in all our business of government and all our parliamentary endeavours and their endeavours as individual uh, MSPs, uh, you know, talking the language of human rights. I think there's always an ongoing challenge about uh, dumping jargon and trying to demystify uh, this world of human rights. Um, and I, I suppose if, with the greatest sort of respect to the lawyers, um, you know, this isn't just an area for lawyers, so we have to be taking, you know, some of this narrative and discourse away from uh, the lawyers and uh, putting it into uh, everyday uh, language. I think what you mentioned about the work you've done uh, with breakout groups is really important, and this might be something that we come, come back to. Um, I, I think one of the most um, important developments in how we legislate and in how we develop policy um, over, you know, probably the past decade. It has been the work that we are now uh, intensively pursuing about really tapping into the talents of folk with lived experience, whatever that lived experience is. And you can see that in the range of poverty truth commissions uh, that have been established. You can see that in how we as a government um, engage with that. Um, the poverty truth commissions uh, were pivotal in our dialogue around Fairer Scotland. 
um, the experience panels and how that shaped um, our new social security legislation and how that will continue to shape social security policy and our agency, uh, I'm sure we'll uh, touch upon. Um, but if there's one thing that really gives me uh, hope, I suppose it's what I visibly experience like others when I go in and out of schools. Um, so, you know, when I was young, and this is going to make me sound uh, extremely old, when as a child I was given it, it's no fair, and my mother would be like, it's tough, you know, life's no fair. Um, the, the, the debates that we have with our, our own children and the, the discussion and dialogue that we're having uh, within schools um, as, um, you know, I think as adults, we, we no longer rest on the tough, you know, life's not fair. Um, our children have that uh, sense of justice and, and, and fairness um, in terms of the rights, respect and schools agenda. I think in terms of what Curriculum <coughs> for Excellence has done, in terms of that focus on citizenship and actually empowering young people, um, I know as a committee you've spoke a lot about uh, the Youth Parliament um, and how you see a generation <coughs> of young people absolutely up and at it uh, and prepared to articulate what their rights are uh, and uh, prepared to advocate uh, for those rights and uh, to really press down on those with uh, you know, parliamentary and government responsibilities about how we are implementing and delivering on those rights. Thank you. Um, about reaching people and, and yeah, I completely agree that, that people with lived experience are, are the people that you know we should be speaking to all the time. The Scottish Youth Parliament and the people that tend to belong to groups have, from what I can see, and, and you touched on it there, quite a good notion of what their human rights are already. How do we reach the disadvantaged groups, the people that would never think of standing for the youth parliament, for example, mm -hmm. people from deprived areas, or you know, people that aren't part of disability groups, etc. How do we reach those people? And again, I think that's a very fundamental point. Um, how do you get beyond uh, those that are already, you know, very proactively involved in established uh, structures? Um, so there is the issue about that that, that wider um, engagement uh, about normalising human rights, that is part of our everyday language, uh, and, and relevance, uh, trying to keep it real um, and give those real life examples of where human rights has made a positive impact and taken it out of the uh, academic and uh, legalese. But it is also about an issue of uh, re re representation, so that if our national institutions, be that parliamentary, be that government, uh, be that uh, youth organisations, uh, be that other uh, you know, organisations in Civic Scotland, that um, if, if we are only uh, representing or if those who are participating in these organisations uh, are only, uh, you know, for example, you know, white and middle class, uh, that, that there's a failure there. So we have um, throughout our society, and you know, it starts with government in terms of leadership, we have to ensure uh, that we have representation of Scotland's di diverse communities and diverse backgrounds, and that includes uh, socio-economic backgrounds as well. Okay, let's go on. Thank you very much, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning to the officials as well. Can I start by proffering my apologies? I have to slip out for a few minutes uh, at 10 o'clock uh, due to an unavoidable commitment. Um, Cabinet Secretary, we as a committee have taken a lot of evidence about our mandate really to try and draw human rights through the Scottish Parliament and through the workings of the Scottish Parliament, making it real and not just a tick box exercise. We've got some very uh, specific and gran granular recommendations on that we're going to uh, bring forward. But that's only half the battle because obviously a lot of the policy work that comes before this. Uh, Parliament starts in the Scottish Government um, and I'd like to start by asking you what uh, as you understand it the sort of filter that we push uh, legislation through in terms of uh, rights impact assessments or equalities impact assessments and your view as to how effective those are before they even come to the Scottish Parliament. Okay, I mean, it is important to stress that um, the, the, the duties that you describe um, and those responsibilities around uh, impact assessments and the, the preparedness 
of policy work uh, and legislation uh, before it is introduced uh, to Parliament uh, has to you know, undergo a rigour uh, that uh, human rights and equalities uh, needs to be sown uh, throughout that. Uh, you'll be you know, familiar as I am with the processes around um, you know, legislative you know, compliance with ECHR <coughs> and you know, the work um, that will go on you know, collectively you know, across government. Um, you know, individual ministers will have you know, specific portfolio responsibilities, but there is a, a, a collective uh, responsibility um, across government. Um, in terms of how policy is shaped across portfolios, in terms of, um, you know, I suppose even things like the sharing of cabinet papers in advance, you know, of cabinet meetings, um, the way in which these papers and uh, discussions are structured around our uh, obligations and the connections um, across government. Now, none of this is rocket science, you would expect uh, this in terms of good governance actually for, for, for any um, organisation. And then, you know, there's a the next step when, you know, policy um, or legislation in particular is introduced in terms of the, the, the issues uh, that are detailed in a, a consultation document, how accessible that is, how explicit consultation documents are about putting human rights uh, into, into practice. Uh, there is obviously policy memorandum uh, documents that I'm sure you all study really closely in terms of uh, your work as uh, parliamentarians. And then, you know, we have that uh, scrutiny process where things are debated, tested, pulled together uh, in terms of committee and in, in, in chamber. Uh, and there's the voices of Civic Scotland from um, out, out with that. So I suppose that's a, a, an overall process of, of many, many parts, um, except in that um, the, more, the more that we can get right from the beginning um, improves the prospects of um, a journey that's iterative and is about continuous improvement. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, it is clear that there are mechanisms um, in policy development which are meant to deliver this, although we, we found recently an example where that wasn't happening, and my colleagues um, will be getting tired of this example, but it serves a purpose, and that is the, the draft uh, Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill, um, which um, absolutely has human rights at its core. It, it answers one of our outstanding commitments to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child in respect of the age of, of criminal responsibility in this uh, country. But on the first cut, um, we identified the first time we looked at the bill as a committee that the, there's a section in that bill um, around place of safety where young people can theoretically be taken to a police station for their own protection, which is a direct contravention of their Article 37 rights under the UNCRC. So the, there is an incoherence in that bill, and, and I think you know, it speaks to perhaps a lack of rights literacy right across all the silos of government. So that came obviously from justice. Um, and and I, I wonder if um, the Cabinet Secretary would offer her view on whether we actually need from the right out of the traps, when build teams are formed, whether there should be somebody in that build team who has an understanding of the conventions or treaties to which we're signatory, which apply to that legislation to inform that drafting process from the start. So there's a number of uh, really important um, is issues there. Now, I don't want to preempt the, the scrutiny and the dialogue that this committee will have um, with uh, the, the relevant portfolio minister when it comes to it. But if I can just touch upon, you know, the, the, the very real example uh, that, that you've given before I talk about the issue of rights literacy and the issues that you've suggested around um, Bill's team. Now, um, I'm sure we would all agree uh, that given the importance of the uh, age of criminal responsibility uh, forthcoming legislation, and uh, the, the age of the children <laughs> that we're talking about concerned <coughs> that absolutely wh wh wherever and whenever possible uh, that we uh, have to avoid police stations being used as a place of safety. Um, and I'm sure uh, there is agreement about that. And as part of um, that process in terms of the, the infrastructure around uh, making rights real in the context of this particular bill, I know there's a stakeholder delivery group that does uh, include uh, representatives of children's rights um, organisations, uh, which you know, will look at the best practice uh, approaches 
uh, and to help us achieve actually what we all um, achieve. I suppose uh, what uh, I am uh, cognizant uh, of, uh, absolutely you mentioned uh, Article uh, 37 in terms of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, where if I recall rightly, talks about uh, that the detention uh, of a child has to be the last resort and for the shortest uh, appropriate period. And uh, my recollection of the particular section in the bill uh, that the, the member is, is referring to um, it is talking about um, um, you know, thresholds around uh, should it be necessary, an important word, to take a child to a place of safety to protect any other person from an immediate risk of significant harm and that, that period of removal to a place of safety should be for no, more, no longer than uh, 24 hours. And I'm just, you know, I'm highlighting, you know, these phrases about necessary, immediate risk, significant harm, and no longer than 24 hours, because those are the phrases that, um, you know, committee will have to be uh, testing, uh, that the minister will have to be uh, responding to, in the context of, um, you know, we hope very rare uh, circumstances uh, where events. Uh, that uh, have the potential to cause significant harm and there are issues about you know remote communities and out of hours now i'm not seeing you know um issues around remote communities and out of hours you know necessarily means a particular course of action or a particular articulation of rights uh, in, in the bill i suppose just what i'm trying to flesh out um, is that given what the uncr says uh, given what the current uh, bill says, uh, which um, is similar to what's currently in the Children's Year in Scotland Act, you know, committee is really going to have to test these things robustly and, you know, how, how would these scenarios be avoided in practice mm -hmm. and what legislative scope or framing is or isn't, isn't required. So I apologise for the length of that. No, not, not at all. And forgive me, I, I wasn't asking you to um, speak specifically no. to that, that issue. It no. was more the general theme that where we are talking about having, um, you know, rights champions on every committee in this uh, parliament who are trained and understand yeah. the rights landscape, um, would uh, is is there a similar view uh, that there should be something similar within the silos of government so that bill teams have people or directorates have people within them who um, forensically understand the rights landscape around it, all the legislation that might come through or from their, their particular directorate to inform that so that there might not be a clash or, or something that we wouldn't have to then try and amend um, somewhere yeah. down the track? So, so, and, and you know, my, my apologies for, for, for the length of, of, of that answer. I, I was um, trying not to, you know, go into the issues that you will, you know, focus on um, in, in due course, but actually to try and talk about this in a real way. Um, and I suppose to give some assurance to the committee that we don't just, you know, pr produce things, you know, out, out of thin air, that actually, uh, there, you know, for this bill and indeed for other bills, these are matters that are actively considered. Now, people might not um, appreciate the level of consideration or indeed the conclusions, but that's um, a different, a different matter. Um, I think it, my, my experience of bill teams uh, is that they're very robust, they're very thorough. Uh, my experience of Scottish government uh, lawyers. Um, and Scottish Government Legal Department <coughs> is that they are very well versed uh, in, in, in human rights uh, and um, are often you know, a prompt uh, or a check uh, and a, a resource for, 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 for ministers. Um, so, I mean, that, that's just my experience over you know, a number of years over a number of bills. I think the issue about rights literacy, though, um, you know, isn't just one for bill teams and, and legal teams. Uh, actually, it's you know you have to ensure uh, the capacity of, of the organisation of, of a whole. And while I can point to the things that uh, government is doing with civil servants uh, and you know how we operate as ministers, uh, that would point to you know a good understanding. Um, you know, there's a high proportion. 
um, of civil servants that have been um, involved in uh, equality impact ex uh, uh, assessments, for, for example. I do think it's an area that you can't just can't be complacent about, um, because it's uh, often an area that's not black or white. Um, it requires difficult choices. I know that your committee has touched upon, you know, competing rights and competing, you know, ob obligations. Uh, so we just can't be complacent about, uh, you know, uh, rights, literacy, and that it's something that, you know, we have to have an enduring commitment to in terms of increasing understanding the capacity within, within government. Thank you. Okay. Cabinet Secretary, can I just follow on for that uh, very quickly in, in as much as we have a financial memorandum and a policy memorandum mm -hmm. that come along with a bill. <clears throat> would, would you be supportive, maybe I'm putting you on the spot here actually, but would you be supportive of an equality and human rights impact assessment coming along with a bill? And not just it's an assessment of compliance, but it's an assessment of the opportunities contained within that bill to further advance uh, rights um, under um, a human rights um, umbrella. I think I, I mean, I'm certainly open to uh, suggestions that um, are going to help in promoting a culture that's can do and that this is something we embrace and feel positive about and gets us away from that sort of tick box mm. um, exercise and here's another forum uh, to, 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 to fill out, you know, here's some more questions uh, to, to, to answer. And, you know, we want to be... Uh, in this work in terms of uh, mainstreaming a human rights approach. Uh, we want folk to be really positive, enthusiastic about it and implement it with joy uh, in their hearts. Um, and I suppose that gets to you know, how best to do that. So I can see um, a logic for, for, for a framework that, 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 that's helpful. Um, I suppose I would have a wee bit of caution about you know something else that's yeah. seen as a, a layer of of, of, of bureaucracy. Um, so you know, uh, fr frameworks I, th I think are, are positive. Um, things that can um, empower staff to really inject uh, you know their thinking and their talents uh, into you know policy memorandums and financial memorandums about how we make human rights real in Scotland. Uh, I am I'm very open to. I always have a bit of caution about, you know, whether we are we are adding to, you know, layers of bureaucracy and mechanisms that mm -hmm. actually might not produce outcomes at, at the end of in, in, end of the day. So I suppose it goes back to the question of of how we would do that. Yeah, and the quality of it as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Mary Fee. Thank you, Karina, and, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, panel. Um, I have a, a couple of brief um, follow-on questions from the questions posed by my um, two colleagues before I ask um, my substantive question. Um, following on from Alex Cole Hamilton's line of questioning, I'd be interested in your view on, on whether or not, without full incorporation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, can we really, truly protect children's rights? So, uh, I, I am not someone who is uh, hostile to the debate around um, incorporation. And I hope you would recognise that that applies across government because uh, there are two very important uh, programme for government commitments. Uh, so one is the uh, establishment of the First Minister's Advisory Group on, on Human Rights. Um, and while the, the, the genesis of that is, I suppose, the context of, of Brexit and how we don't ensure that in, in the context of whatever happens in Scotland, that we're, we're not stepping back mm. uh, from, from rights, that we're not seeing that regression. The other um, part of um, Professor Miller's uh, work uh, is actually uh, to, to, to look at the issue of um, in, in incorporation in the context of how we give uh, further and better effect uh, to make rights uh, real in, in, in Scotland. And that ties in with another programme for government commitment, uh, which um, was the audit uh, of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in terms of our, our, our policy uh, around supporting uh, children and, and families and that audit mm -hmm. is underway and the, the work around that audit includes uh, the issue of um, incorporation. 
And it's an area that uh, the First Minister has spoken um, extensively um, about as well. So we are actively engaging in that debate um, about uh, incorporation. And I suppose uh, I, I have two, two views um, about that. Um, I don't think that uh, nothing can be achieved without incorporation. I think that's um, an, an oversimplification. Uh, um, the other uh, thing I'm uh, acutely conscious of is that um, incorporation isn't necessarily uh, a silver bullet. Um, it isn't um, uh, necessarily some sort of um, standalone um, solution. And we will go back uh, time and time again. Um, actually, the debate is more about how uh, we implement and how uh, incorporation um, has a real meaningful uh, impact. Um, because again, I'm, I'm conscious that, um, I suppose, the terminology around uh, incorporation um, in some ways has become um, a shorthand for what is actually often a complex implementation challenge. And I'm not saying that we should shy away from complex challenges. I just think it's right to recognise where challenges are complex. I think it's right that we are having a debate about the how. And I think it's right that we are you know, open to uh, expert advice um, and open to the views uh, of Civic Scotland uh, about the benefits in corporation, uh, but also uh, some of the uh, challenges around it as well. Um, and you know, the question is whether incorporation in itself <coughs> delivers um, accessibility um, and whether it deliv delivers legal certainty uh, for both duty bearers and, and, and right, right holders. So it's an area that we're actively engaged in. When you talk about um, the, the ongoing work and the audits that are being carried out, can you share with the committee any timescales for the completion of those pieces of work or would you be able to share with the committee in the future? So the uh, First Minister's uh, ad advisory group is planning to uh, report uh, in December. Uh, so that's you know, work that's proceeding uh, with uh, a pace. And the uh, <coughs> audit, uh, the UNCRC audit, um, is currently ongoing. And from memory, and I'll have to double check this with, with education colleagues, um, is that uh, we would be expecting something either later on this year or, or, or next year, but I'll double, I'll double check that. That would that, be helpful. Thank you. Um, when you um, were making your opening remarks, you spoke about the act of participation of rights holders. <coughs> and it comes back to the question that, that Gail Ross asked you about, how do we make human rights real and tangible for, for, for everyone? And I just wondered if you think there is more of a role that schools can play in this. I know schools do a lot of really good work, but as we, as we take forward the whole dialogue around human rights and the impact that it has on everyone, um, it's almost as if there's a dual role. There, there's a role for stakeholders to play in almost doing the top down, but there's also a role for schools to do the bottom up. Mm -hmm. um, because everyone's not going to become literate and aware of their human rights overnight. It, it could take a, a number of years. And if we embed it properly in the curriculum, um, that, that will f filter through. So we'll have a generation that will be fully, f will have a full understanding of what their, their rights are. So do you think there's more of a role that, that education could play? I actually think there's more of a role for, 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 for everyone. Um, and I'm sure there's more of a role uh, for, for, for education. I suppose in terms of when looking at the, the, the bigger picture, um, the shining examples of, of good practice mm -hmm is actually within their education uh, system. And I think uh, the points you were raising about you know, other areas um, of society um, are probably, um, you know, some of those areas will, will be in more need uh, of, of attention. So, you know, I know that, um, so I know that women's organisations uh, do a lot uh, to inform 
um, the nation as a whole, but also the women that they're working with and supporting <coughs> as individuals uh, and you know other community groups um, about you know the, the rights that women have in terms of um, you know international treaty obligations, but actually you know they, they're in the, the, the discourse about how all of that translates into you know policy uh, and practice um, and. You know, many of the, the, the debates that we have around, you know, ending violence against women and girls are often uh, rooted in, in human rights. But there are other groups um, of, of people and other communities that um, I fear are less aware mm. of, of their rights. Um, and I know you and I have often mm -hmm. uh, discussed gypsy travellers. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Uh, you know, there are particular groups that are disenfranchised mm -hmm. and discriminated against uh, who I, I think are far less aware of, of mm -hmm. their rights. And, I think, and I'm really hopeful and encouraged. We should, shouldn't take our foot off the gas in yeah. terms of what's happening in education or, you know, the work <coughs> that we're doing to end violence against uh, women and, and, and girls. But there are other particular communities that I think we've got a lot more work to do to ensure that they know mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what their rights are. Um, and just as, as an aside, um, I, I recently increased the, the, the funding uh, to uh, an organisation, Roman of Lav, uh, who we currently fund um, so that uh, they could do some more outreach work with interpreters, and that was about reaching out to the uh, Roma community mm -hmm. um, where there were issues about... Um, immigration services um, in terms of compliance and not uh, actually using interpreters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was quite a, a practical example of where we, you know, with a modest amount of uh, funding could enable, you know, a local organisation mm -hmm. on the ground to be doing something very practical uh, to be, you know, providing a service but also to be informing people of their rights. Okay. The, the question that I have asked of um, every panel, and you touched on it in a previous answer, was how how do we balance competing rights? How, how do we navigate our way through the rights of um, individuals? How, how do we prioritise one right over another? So, um, so I mean, th th this is where um, dialogue and exploration... Um, and you know whether you're talking about incorporation, whether you're talking mm -hmm. about you know as we were earlier about uh, specific uh, sections uh, in a particular bill, this is actually about how we ensure rights are real. Because uh, if everybody has uh, equal equal rights, um, and we don't have a, a hierarchy of rights, um, we you know, are, are then, you know, having to make uh, judgments that may well be, you know, challenged. Uh, we will be having to, um, I suppose, rely on principles um, around, you know, things like risk, uh, about what's proportionate. Um, some of this um, is actually common sense. I suppose some of this is what we do in, in, in everyday life. Um, as well, so um, there can be, you know, competing issues. You know, the rights of a child, you know, uh, versus the rights of, of, of parents. But I suppose the, the human rights approach, um, I suppose, encourages not to look at one issue versus the other. You know, it's requiring us to unpick the issues about what's fair, about what's proportionate. Mm. Um, you know, recognising that you know everybody has a stake, um, and then it's about how we how we deliver that in practice. Okay, and just finally, um, cabinet secretary, can I ask if you can um, give committee a, a, any update on the um, the three year programme that the first minister announced last year as part of the programme for government on raising awareness of ch of children's rights? I know it only started at the beginning of this year, and we're not long into the year. But if you could give us any update. Or if, if you could perhaps write to the committee and give them an update. I'll, I'll write to the committee with that. I know that work has uh, commenced, um, but I would rather provide committee more accurate information from other uh, portfolio colleagues who would be able to give you a, a, a better structure and a better timeline. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank okay, you very thanks very much. I've got a quick supplementary from Gail, if you want to 
jump in very quickly with that one and then I can go to Fulton. Yeah, sure. Thanks, um, Convener. We heard um, evidence from the Ombudsman in Northern Ireland and she has quite a lot of judicial powers um, with regards to human rights. And also there was evidence that um, there's a, a, a thought, an opinion that the Scottish Human Rights Commission should also be given some more powers. What are your opinions on this, if you have any at all? So uh, I, I'm conscious uh, that I always have opinions. Um, but I'm also conscious you know, that I'm here today representing uh, government and that uh, while uh, there is always a need for uh, collaboration and a shared understanding, um, I'm also conscious that you know, there are different spheres of responsibility for government and from parliament and to that of our, our national human rights institutions. So I think in terms of you know, should the powers um, of the Scottish Human Rights Commission um, and you know, where powers of uh, ombudsmen or, or women should be enhanced, I think that is rightly an issue for parliament. Um, as opposed to me and my capacity as a government minister given uh, an, an, an opinion. And I think, you know, this, this is about, you know, we have layers of responsibilities and, and spheres, and it is about checks and, and balances. So I'm not trying to duck the issue, but I just genuinely think that is a matter that's appropriate for Parliament as opposed to me. Thank you. Thank you. Philip McGregor. Thanks, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. You, you mentioned uh, some of the ongoing work of Professor Alan Miller, who we, we had in last week um, uh, for a very, very detailed uh, session. Um, uh, he was talking about his work uh, leading up the advisory group. How do you think that Brexit impacts on human rights, and especially perhaps in your answer in, in relation to EU nationals and migrant workers? Yeah. Um, I always feel very uh, positive and upbeat when I come to committee to talk about human rights and then uh, we're asked about Brexit <laughs> and uh, have that sense of uh, doom uh, and depression. Um, because actually, you know, there, there, there's a journey that no one really knows uh, the outcome of. So, you know, members will be um, as aware as I am that uh, the, the, the UK uh, withdrawal bill is currently with uh, the, the House of Lords. Um, and I was uh, pleased uh, to see um, that the, the issue of retaining the, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights as a part of domestic law, um, that there were successful amendments uh, in the laws that recognised you know, that, that important link. And that's an important matter, um, not just you know, from, from the Scottish Government's perspective, but uh, from other uh, stakeholders as well, that uh, removing uh, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights as part of our domestic uh, law, I think one of your witnesses described as, as, as a loss of a, a, a security uh, blanket. Uh, because it is accurate, and I think this is where um, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission uh, and other stakeholders such as Amnesty uh, done, done a really good job uh, in robustly um, explaining that, you know, uh, yes, we have human rights legislation. Uh, yes, we have the Equalities uh, Act. But that's not the same as uh, <coughs> the, the EU uh, Charter on, on, on Fundamental Rights. Um, and my understanding of, of, of the Fundamental Charter is uh, that you know goes further than the, the European Convention on Human Rights in that it gives better effect to uh, economic, social and cultural rights, you know, it gives, a, it gives a better articulation and that it's actually, you know, rooted uh, in uh, you know, some of the, the real issues around health, housing uh, and, and employment. And I think it, it would be a real loss uh, for not to have, um, you know, the, 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 the EU uh, fundamental charter as part of our domestic law and that would be um, a step backwards. Um, and you will have heard that, you know, from countless, countless uh, witnesses. And we're now in the situation where, so, you know, the, the, the bills, uh, UK government's bills with the Lords, there's been these successful amendments to retain that link between domestic law and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And then we will enter, um, I think, Westminster Parliament as a period of ping pong where, you know, we expect the bill to go back and forth um, a bit. And that, of course, you know, creates... Um, it creates uncertainty um, and, you know, 
it creates uh, a risk over, you know, that, 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 uh, over a, a longer period uh, of time as well. Thanks very much. Convener, just to, to ask uh, uh, your, your advice, I'd like to question on to a wider uh, issue of prejudice, but I don't know what we're like for time. We've, we've not, we've let, let me get Annie in first and then I can, I can come back to you if we've got, because we're, okay. we're quickly running out of time and we've got a big panel for the second session. I'd quite like to dedicate enough time to that one. Annie. Thanks, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, panel. Um, I've just got a couple of bits, probably following on from, from Mary's sort of a question and obviously the balance of the the core fundamental rights and other rights, but also you spoke in your opening statement about effective human rights training and that human rights was at the core of everyone's job in government. And as a committee, if we are going to be looking at human rights as a whole to make sure that we are the, the sort of a duty bearers and we are leaders in it, do you think, or what's the proposals from the Scottish Government to make sure every parliamentarian has got human rights at its core? Because we aren't human rights experts, but we want to make sure that we are delivering a human rights approach across whatever we sort of do. So, so, so the government's responsibility in terms of uh, training and awareness and uh, integration into uh, DED practice would be uh, to ensure, to enable that within the, the, the civil service workforce and ministers. Um, again, you know, as, as a, I, I don't think it's appropriate for a government minister for me to be proffering opinions about what training parliamentarians should be going through, uh, given that it's the job of parliamentarians to be scrutinising me. I just think it's, 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 it would be a bit cheeky um, for a government minister to be saying, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what, what, what training or opportunities parliamentarians have uh, or, or should undertake. But I think, you know, the, the, the general point about... Um, you know, more awareness uh, reason. Uh, training, I'm, I'm not a a averse to training. I think how it's done is really important. Um, you know, again, um, it has to be done in a way that's about um, empowering people. Uh, it has to be done in a way that's about um, how it can be applied in practice that's integral to everything we do. Again, training can be provided in a way that bolsters silos. And actually what we're trying to do is get a real cross-portfolio integrated uh, joint work and articulation and delivery of human rights. And I think how, how training supports that is, is very important. Just ask you another quick one. Thanks very much for, for your answer. The other bit that I was going to sort of say is we've spoken in the during more evidence sessions about each committee having a human rights rapporteur attached to it, um, which I think most of our, the people that have had evidence from thinks it's a, a good idea. But we also spoke with some local councils as well who have got equality officers, but the human rights bit is, is well adding on to that. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's important that... We, t we split human rights and equality, because I think, for me, I, I see it as integral but separate as well. And we know that the Equality Impact Assessment Statements, we've heard from a, a councillor as well, saying that they are tick box exercise at times. How do we make sure that each committee and each local authority actually embeds human rights at its core? OK, again, I'm not sure it's for a government minister to be telling committees how to do their business. Uh, I can imagine that there'd be a number of committee conveners that would get a bit, uh, rightly so, irate. Um, well, even um, even just the local that. authority but, side of it then? I, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of, um, you know, operationalising uh, human rights from a Scottish government uh, point of view, public sector, uh, point of view, including our partners and, and local government. The, the challenge here is how we get away from a tick box mm -hmm. mentality. And, and I understand uh, and I uh, can see the added value of people in specialist uh, roles. Um, but it's whether the proliferation of specialist roles, uh, either whether that's attached to committee or attached to bill team <coughs> or attached to uh, portfolios or departments uh, in health or, or, or local government, it's whether that really helps to mainstream when we're trying to get across, actually, you can't, nobody can opt out of this. Mm -hmm. This is everybody's uh, job. So while I think there is a role for, for people with um, that, that, that specialist input to help mainstream, I think 
the, the bigger prize is a big and everybody uh, to take this to their hearts and put it into practice mm -hmm. uh, rather than a, a proliferation of specific rules and uh, specific um, you know as assessment forums but I do think that, that, that there's a balance somewhere it's whether you can use specialisms to mainstream and, mm -hmm. and in green I hope that's helpful yes thanks okay uh, Fulton's just informed me he's going to take his question up with the next panel because he thinks it might be more appropriate to place there. So that, that okay. sort of ends our direct questions to you today, Cabinet Secretary. But there's, there's a couple of areas that maybe we didn't get to, you know, get okay. in, into deeply enough. So we, I think we, we'll, we'll fire off a wee letter to you to get some of that uh, more detail. And if the information that you said you would write to us about earlier, yes. if, if that could be provided in the, in the same way, that would be really helpful indeed. Can I uh, give our grateful thanks from the committee this morning for your attendance and for the continuing uh, correspondence that we'll have on this, this inquiry. This inquiry is going to run for another few weeks because we're hoping to hear from some uh, work that's been done at the UN, so we're, we're, we're waiting for that to be published. So um, we will certainly come back to you at the end of the process with the report uh, and, and hopefully some uh, communications on how we can move some of the recommendations forward. But thank you Good. so much, okay. Cabinet Secretary. I'm going thank to suspend you. committee uh, for five quick minutes to allow the table to be set up for the round table and back in, this, back in your seats, please.
Good morning and welcome back to the Equality and Human Rights Committee to the second panel this morning on our continuing um, inquiry on human rights and the Scottish Parliament. And it's a real joy this morning to have a table full of young people. Uh, it makes us feel young as well, so thanks for bringing your youth into the room. Uh, with us this morning, I'm just going to go very, very quick round the table. With us this morning, we have Claudia MacDonald, who's the Director of Influencing, and we have Callum Lynch, Public Affairs Ambassador from Who Cares Scotland. Sana Aziz, MSYP, who's a convener of my sister committee, the Equality Human Rights Committee. Um, so I'm shadowing Sana today to make sure I know how to do it right. Uh, Laura Pasternak, who is a Public Affairs Officer at the Scottish Youth Parliament. Juliet Harris, the Director of Together, Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights, with Dylan, who is a member of the Children's Parliament, and Hannah, who is a member of the Children's Par Parliament, who will be supported today by St uh, Chelsea Stinson, Children's Voices Programme Manager at the Children's Parliament. Lucinda Rivers, who is the Head of UNICEF UK in Scotland, uh, UNICEF UK, and we know all about rights respecting schools, and we'll be keen to hear more about that this morning. And with us this morning, we have Rama, Mika, Mariam, uh, who are supported today with, by Khalida Noon, who is the Service Coordinator for Heritage and Inclusion at Action for Scotland. So, thank you so much for coming to committee this morning. Thank you for the written evidence that we've received from the organisations who are supporting you all here today. It's been very, very helpful. You'll have seen the earlier panel with the Cabinet Secretary at that side of the table, and you realise this is a very different setup because this is what we call a round table, because we get everybody around the table and you all get your tuppence worth in, and we're very keen to hear that this morning. The rules of this one is you catch my eye, and I've got a wee list here and I make sure everybody who wants in gets in um, and hopefully maybe if you're a wee bit shy we can make some space for you to get in and say what you've got to say as well but please don't feel shy don't feel intimidated we're here to listen to you today and we're very very keen to hear what you've got to say and if you were here for the first session you would have heard the first question and that's how we're going to going to open just to give you that bit of familiarity I'm going to go straight to Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everyone, and thanks very much for coming along. It's really important that we hear from you today. I'm going to start off the same way as we started off the first panel. Obviously, as young people, you're very aware of what your rights are, but how do you think that we as a committee and the Scottish Parliament can help you show leadership in your communities and across wider society to make people understand what their rights are? Sana, would you want to come in first, just given the work that your committee and the, the Youth Parliament are doing around this agenda? Um, sure. Um, so what we do is we do a lot of consultations with our young people in our constituencies. Um, like a way to do that is kind of just going into schools and talking to them and making them aware. So I help my local council with rights respect in schools because we're trying to get that everywhere and that's how we're kind of mainly taking charge in um, spreading awareness of young people's rights and um, as the youth parliament we we just we do consultations and we bring it up and we we have motions when it comes to our sittings and um, there was an actual motion passed if I can find it um, uh, the Scottish Youth Parliament believes that young people should be taught about and empowered to stand up for their human rights through personal, social and health education, PSHE, uh, or its equivalent in their curriculum. Um, and that was a joint motion by our Qualities Committee and our committee, the Equality and Human Rights, and it was passed with a 92% agreement with our young people. Um, so we're very passionate about the subject and with our, policy, uh, with our policy that's been passed, so now we're going to advocate it with any decision makers we meet and we're, we're going to say this is our policy and this is what we want to happen in, in our schools and that's basically what we do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hannah or Dylan, would you like to tell us about the work that you're doing with the Children's Parliament? Well, what we've been doing recently is we've been doing multiple workshops across Scotland in different schools just to kind of inform them about what it means to be a children's human rights defender, which is a child who is willing to stand up for not only themselves but other children's rights. Well done. That's great. <clears throat> Dylan, do you think, given Gail's question, 
of how we as a committee can make recommendations to make rights real uh, in your world, in your school, in your communities, and in the things that you do. D can, do, do you think that that's a good thing, or do you think that we, you've got some ideas that we can use? No, it's definitely a great thing that we should definitely implement into near enough every school, if not every school across the UK and Scotland. Okay, th thanks. Thanks very much. Dylan, um, Kalida, do you want to tell us a wee bit about the work that you're doing in schools in Edinburgh and maybe bring in some of the young people that you're with today to explain mm -hmm. to us a wee bit about what you're doing, but how it relates to Gail's question and how mm -hmm. we can make rights real? So, um, for Action for Children, um, we develop a heritage inclusion in secondary schools in Edinburgh to make sure that we hear the voices and we work with uh, minority ethnic young people because often they get um, um, excluded and, you know, the lack of awareness around their cultural barriers and issues um, are highlighted within the curriculum. So we develop programmes that make that enables them to have, you know, be proud of themselves, be proud of their identity and their heritage and self worth. And this, you know, gives that confidence. So when we first meet young people, we start just to get to know them, building trust. And for for Action for Children, we do believe that, you know, this is the way of exploring their heritage and inclusion is this is the, the start of them understanding their rights and I've got a, a, a few of our um, young people who participated uh, two years ago we've come at the end of it and we've we deliver um, Duke of Edinburgh throughout and you know we are the first and um, this is the first sort of within Duke of Edinburgh the biggest largest participation of um, ethnic minority young women in Edinburgh than the whole of Scotland and we've had to ad adapt the award to meet the needs of these young people because often the award is you know does it didn't before used to um enable our some of our young people with regards to staying over at night time so we've adapted the award to make sure these young people can get their bronze silver and gold duke of edinburgh so we're just about to host um a celebration event given 50 young minority ethnic women at uh, the Duke of Edinburgh Award. So um, the, gar the girls have been uh, working on some of the things that they, they want to talk about, which the project perhaps gave them and, you know, about like sharing good practice as well. This is their voice will help share good practice for other schools to be aware that you know, there's pockets of communities that aren't engaged in anything and we have to reach them and it's through education in school that we can do that. So um, Rama, do you want to say a little bit first about what, what the project's done for you? Okay. Um, I started off like not knowing my rights in school and I didn't know like who to turn to because many of the, te like, the teachers in my school weren't really aware of like the things I was going through, like with the racism, and someone told me that I couldn't stay on a school, I didn't have the ability to do well. But when I joined the group, I found like Khalida, who I could speak to. I knew my rights and I knew that I wanted to stay on. Now I'm doing four hires, and if it wasn't for this project, I wouldn't have the confidence to be here to speak to all of you. And have the, opp the opportunities that I do right now, like taking part in the chat remark and being able to speak to young people next year to help them because if it wasn't for the project, I wouldn't have had the help I did. Excellent, thank you. Miriam, do you want to say a little bit about um, what you've, what maybe a little bit of discrimination you felt with being a young Muslim woman and how you feel that the, the schools maybe don't understand your, who you are and the challenges you face? Um, well, I think a lot of it is just kind of always feeling like you're excluded and you don't always like feel included and that you can't like be who you are. So I think, you know, creating the Heritage Project was also like very important because it allows you to sort of like know who you are and express yourself, which is something that you can't always do at school because like people don't always understand. 
So did you feel that the, when you first started the group, it was more of a safe space? And how do you think the other participants felt? I think at first I wasn't quite sure like what to expect from it. And I think a lot of the other like pupils felt the same way too. But then after we, like, we were in the group, it became sort of a safe, a safe place for us to sort of just express our feelings and our opinion. And um, Rama, I'll go to you again. Um, you, 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 at school, you, you face um, some discrimination in school, and sometimes I know that you felt, you know, angry, and sometimes you'd lash out uh, with that. So how did that? Do you think being like that? How did that affect you in school, and what teachers thought of you? Well, like, being racially discriminated happened so many times in school that complaining to teachers became, like, almost, like, that. Like I felt like it would annoy them because it happened so many times. And it got me, like, angry and frustrated because there was no one to, like, speak to. But when I joined the project, I calmed down a bit and I, like, knew that, like, my studying was more important and I could speak to Khalida and speak to the other members of the project as well because they were going through similar things. And what's it? I got to stay on at school because I was getting told that I couldn't stay on, but then, and like, I didn't have a p potential, but. And now you're doing four hires. Now I'm doing four hires and, yeah. And Mika, what do you think about sort of discrimination outside school? How do you feel when you know, you recently got, um, you know, had a, a few issues with you and your friends coming together and going to um, places. How, what, what happens and how does that make you feel? Um, basically, it doesn't really feel that um, you're really included with other people and like the outside world. If people just. Um, don't want to like speak to you in a certain way or are rude or just because I'm in a group with people that have like a darker colour of skin or anything like that. It just it makes you doesn't really feel don't feel confident within yourself and um, going out in public with your friends, like also being teenagers uh, should like hang about should just be something fun, something natural to do. And when other people that work in different places just exclude you or try not to socialise directly to us, it just doesn't it doesn't really boost your confidence at all. And um, I'm lucky to have this project to talk about it and to really feel good about myself and feel good about the people around me that are maybe like going through the same things. Thank, thank, thanks very much. Callum, as a Who Cares a Young Persons um, Ambassador, um, we've seen some of the work that, that, that you've done and highlighting the work that, that you do with young people. And you've heard some of the, the, the stories this morning of how young people feel and the opportunities that they're taking and the organisations that they're, they're working with and the difference that will make and how that will inform the work that we need to do to make uh -huh. the recommendations to government. Can you tell us a bit about what you do and maybe give us some insight in answer to, to Gail's question about how we can maybe change some of the procedures here or build more into the procedures in order to, to do things a bit better? Um, well, I guess in terms of what I've been doing, um, is it okay to take a minute to give some yeah. context as to why this is really important to be here? Um, I think if some of the members look on their desk, there's this image of me when I was 12 years old. Um, I was very petite, very fragile. Um, and I'm a care experienced young person, which means I've had experience of the care system. Um, and I feel that after assessing myself and my life, um, human rights and children's rights is not something that's always been fulfilled. Um, not only prior to going into care, um, but also during care, and I guess to an extent now. Um, so as a child, I was a victim of extreme violence, abuse and neglect. And 
my home was not a safe place. There was drugs and alcohol misuse um, around me consistently, and that led to me, at the age of 10, um, taking drugs. Um, the fridge was bare, and me and my siblings had to steal for food. So my initial start to life was rough, and I would guess my parent wasn't adhering to a lot of my rights. Um, but through the issues that were happening in my, in my home, my behaviour became difficult and challenging, which then led to attention-seeking behaviour within school, which then led to uh, me being removed from, removed from school. And instead of teachers listening to my cries for help, it was I was removed. Um, so it took for me, at the age of 11, to have a breakdown to a social worker for me to be placed into care. Um, and I thought that being placed into care, I would be safe, um, but this was not the case. Um, so as you look at that image of that young boy, um, when I was in care, it was an environment where restraining a child was occurring daily, and this is the same for a lot of young people. Um, and by restraining, um, I mean physically holding and pinning a child down. And I have had first-hand experience of this from younger than I was in this image. Um, so this was people who I thought loved me, who people who I thought that I held a relationship with, and it wasn't nurturing, but it was actually scarring. Um, and now that I reflect back, I know that this didn't happen to my friends or my peers, and I know that their parents would not have called the police for them bringing a mattress into the hallway and jumping on it. And this happened to me, and it happened to so many other young people where we were handcuffed for carrying on and put into the back of police vans. Um, so I think I'm gracious and thankful that I'm here and able to share this with you, um, because human rights and child rights is something so important and I can be an ambassador for young people who are care experienced and say that um, it is something that's crucial for us to know a lot more about and have access to learn a lot more about this. Um, in terms of how we do it, there's ways, obviously we do it through corporate parenting, um, where the government have a responsibility to scrutinise them on their duties, um, which we feel is super important to let care experienced young people know their rights through that uh, process. But I think one of the other really amazing things that Who Cares Scotland has done for the past 40 years is that we have provided independent advocacy for young people in care and we're the only people that do it currently uh, nationally for specifically care experienced young people and this is um, relationship based, it's child centred, it's one to one, it's built on a foundation of trust um, and it's a complete offer, you opt into it um, and I believe that had, had that always been available to me whilst I was on the edge of care, that would have been something that would have been so beneficial prior than going straight into a children's hearing system. Um, I guess reflecting on my experience, um, having an advocate was incredibly important to allow me to understand and access my rights. Um, my advocate, um, he, he had a lot of uniqueness, nerve and talent. Um, he was independent from the system, which again, I can't reiterate how important that is because as a child who you're presented with so many professionals in your life who always remind you that they adhere to the rules from above. It was so important to have someone who was there who was able to contest against what other people wanted to speak for me and allow me to understand my rights to then exercise them. And I think as any child going through a very complex and a very legal system, such as the care system, you ricochet a lot through it and that's how you come to the end and that is why the outcomes are quite poor. Um, so having an advocate and so important to reiterate how important it is for trust and relationship-based and child-centred approach to that um, is fundamentally the only way to do that in a really effective way. Um, and that is fundamentally what we do. And I believe that a lot of the advocates, not to PR, but a lot of the advocates we have are incredible at doing that. Um, so that's a way that I have accessed my rights and a lot of care experienced young people do. But I think it's so important to improve that and give a lot more young people access and resource to that. OK, th thanks very much. Callum, Hannah, I'm <coughs> conscious that you're the only young person that's not managed to speak yet. And before I bring the adults in, I'd quite like to hear from you, if that's OK. And I'm just thinking about what Callum just said about uh, ensuring and realising and seeing people's rights. Maybe if you can tell us a wee bit about the work that you've done at the UN on raising these issues there. Well, <clears throat> the first time we went to the UN, we took a mural and we had worked on this mural for a week. And basically, we took ideas from um, children that go to our schools um, and we took it to the UN to show them what children's views are on their community and um, second time we are planning 
well, the second time I went this year, March, I um, mean, a boy called Cameron went, um, an MCP, and um, we were planning for the DGD, um, General Day of Discussion, in September this year, and um, that's and leading up to that, we were doing workshops um, in children and schools, again, to look at their views and what they think their right, what rights are most important to them. And so far, I've realised that it's more the right for privacy and ed the right to like be educated. Thank, thank you very much, Hannah. Um, Lucinda. I want to come to you next because um, in relation to Gail's question as well, because uh, it's, it's a pertinent question. We've heard from um, groups of young people this morning, so we've heard from the, the young women and the, the discrimination and the issues that they are facing now and how they've used that organisation in order to realise their rights. We've heard from Callum, who said that if he had some of this at an earlier stage, you know, he might have a, a, a different outcome. But I, I know that for your strength of character, Callum, you've, you've had a very positive outcome and, um, and should be proud of that as well. Um, and we've heard from uh, Dylan and Hannah and the work that they are doing in the UN and from Sana and the work that the, the Youth Parliament's doing. Now, we've visited a couple of schools who are UNESCO rights respecting schools and we have seen firsthand as a committee the absolute joy in that and the work that's being done. So I wonder if in relation to answer in Gail's question about how we make rights real, can you tell us how you're doing that in schools? Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity and I'd like to congratulate all the young people who are here today. You're all brilliant. <laughs> I think it's great that we have heard your voices. <clears throat> so um, UNICEF has got UNICEF. Um, we have an office here in Scotland, and we have the mandate to uphold um, from the United Nations General Assembly to uphold the UNCRC, the right, Convention on the Rights of the Child. And here in Scotland, we do it in a number of ways. And you've talked about the rights respecting schools, um, which I would echo what you say. They're amazing school. They're amazing, and, and the children and young people who are in those schools have a, a lot of self belief because I think because they know what their rights are. They have great relationships with their teachers and they have the desire to be the best they can and all of that I think is about the way children's rights are embedded in, in the schools. So we have over 50% of all schools in Scotland are rights respecting. We have an aim by 2021 to have 75%. Um, so we're working very hard on that. Um, so we, but we do a number of other programs as well to ensure that to embed the UNCRC as much as possible. Um, for children, so we work in every maternity unit in Scotland um, to ensure that mothers and babies have the best start of, in life. And we also are doing a child-friendly um, child-friendly city program. One of the first cities in the UK is in Aberdeen. So the idea of that is to embed children's rights throughout the services for children. So whether that's looked after children, it's um, it, it across all services for children. So that is ensuring that. Professionals working with children are taking a rights-based approach to the work that they do. And I think I'd echo what the, um, some of the questions that we talked about before. I mean, any engagement with children has got to be really, me and young people has got to be completely meaningful. We need to ensure that these messages are getting out to children that they and young people and they understand what their rights are. And, and I think the Rights Respecting Schools programme is a, is a very, very good way of delivering those, um, those messages. So, I didn't think there's anything. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Lucinda, Juliet is a campaigning organisation who have been campaigning on the incorporation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child for, for such a long time. You, 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 this will all be very, very familiar uh, to you. Uh, and, I, and I suppose what we're looking for as a committee is some ideas on how we can advance that, how we can embed it, how we can mainstream it. All, all the words that they use to make sure that we make rights real in relation to Gail's question. I wonder if you've got any views on that? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> I thought you would. <laughs> um, I think, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the committee on having such a vibrant round table. It's brilliant to see so many of Together's members, so many children and young people, so many of our policy support people um, sitting around the table for this discussion. Um, and it's brilliant to see this at the heart of the Scottish Parliament. Um, but what I'd also like to say is it's really important that the Scottish Parliament gets out into the spaces where children and young people feel safe, secure and able to talk about their rights. Because this is quite an intimidating environment. I find it scary. Um, 
and it's very difficult to kind of present a coherent message to MSPs and say everything that you want to say. And so the first point I think I'd bring to um, not just this committee, but all MSPs, is remember that children and young people are disenfranchised. They're under the age of 16. They can't vote for you. They can't let you know your, their views. And so that places even more of an obligation on MSPs to actually get out there into the community and talk to children and young people. Find out about these experiences. This shouldn't be a one-off event where we tell you about kind of what the lived experience of children and young people's rights are in Scotland. This should be a recurring thing where MSPs go out to their constituency. Don't just speak to parents. Speak to children and young people in places that they feel safe, secure, and able to tell you what's going on in their lives. Um, I think there are kind of two key points that I'd like to raise with the committee. Um, the first one is around incorporation of the UNCRC. Um, and I know the Cabinet Secretary said in the previous evidence session that it's very complicated. It's not complicated, it's really easy. Um, we just need the Parliament to really support a bill that places our obligations, we have them there in international law. The UK has signed up to the UNCRC. We've said that we're going to take forward all the provisions of the UNCRC. And so all we need is for the Parliament to actually bring that international commitment into domestic law. Um, it shouldn't be complicated because we're bound by it already. And so we just need to explore how we do it. And it's quite a simple process. So the number one thing is incorporate the UNCRC. And this is where I would agree with the Cabinet Secretary. It's certainly not a silver bullet. It's not going to mean that every child's right across Scotland is held up all the time. But it is going to mean that the impact assessments that are done to ensure that bills comply with children's rights are done properly. It is going to make sure that there's that level of scrutiny. And I think really importantly, it's also going to let children and young people know that Scotland is committed to them, the Parliament is committed to them, and that these rights aren't just abstract concepts that, that come from the UN, but these are what really we all want them to have in terms of their lived experience. So that's the first point. The second point is something that we raised in our um, submission to you, which is around an intergroup on children and young people's rights. And I think that's important because children's rights aren't just something that should be looked at by the Equalities and Human Rights Committee or the Education Committee. It needs to be looked at in all areas across justice, transport, homelessness, the, the whole lot. Um, and so to do that, we need to have champions in every single committee. And we need these champions to really speak out for and with children and young people and involve them in the work of the parliament. And so if there's going to be something tangible that comes out of this inquiry, I think it really would be, it'd be brilliant if it was a recommendation to have this intergroup on um, children and young people's rights and have real champions for children and young people's rights in all committees who push the importance of MSPs going out and speaking to the children and young people in their constituencies. It's something that is in place in the European Parliament, so that's a model that's worth looking at and worth considering in terms of your work. Yeah, th th thanks very much, J Julia. A lot of points that you, you've, you've touched on there that I think um, is some of the evidence that we've been hearing going along. Can I reassure you that the committee's been going out to, to different events, um, we have, we have, and we've tried to do them north, south, east, west. So we've had one in Leith, we've had one in Highland, and this week coming on Friday and Monday, we've got one in Clydebank and one in Gala Shields uh, to just make sure we got right down and into the, the borders on Monday. So please be reassured that we are trying to get out and talk to as many people as we can. And last week, I, two weeks ago, I attended a visit with the Cabinet Secretary, which just happened to be in my constituency of a Gypsy Traveller education project, which was superb because the young people ran it and they just got her in and they sat her down and they told her how it was. And then they, they, they ended up with saying, uh, and how are you going to make a difference? Uh, so, which was very good because when you get in a room of young people, it's like, why or how and when are you going to do it? When are you going to fix it? Which is always very important for us. So, so please be reassured that some, some of that works uh, going on, but uh, notwithstanding that, we, we take on board what you say. Um, the European Parliament models, I think, is something that, that we'll, we'll have a wee, a wee look at as well. I want to sort of open now uh, to Mary's question now because um, it, Mary's it, got another aspect of it and I think Mary it might be helpful if you direct your question. Um, well convener I'm well I have been asking the, the, the same question in all, in, in all the um, evidence sessions around balance of, of rights um, and, and I'd still be interested in the views particularly from who cares um, about the rights of, of, of care experienced children, because I think they are completely disadvantaged and completely removed 
um, from the whole rights agenda by the very nature of, of them being um, care experience. And I'd be interested in the views from, from the rest of the, particularly the, the older people in, in the room. But the question I would also like to pose, um, and it's more for, for the, the young people that are sitting around the table with us today. You, you'll all have heard the, the, the previous evidence session and the questions that we asked about how we make rights relevant and, and what this parliament does um, to raise the profile of rights and how we take rights into account when we're doing any piece of, of work in here. But if the cabinet secretary was still here and you had the opportunity to ask her a question, and this is specifically for the young people, whether it's um, Dylan and Hannah from schools or from the, um, the youth parliament or, or Callum, if you could ask it a question, what would that question be? And it could be around, you should be doing this in schools, or the Scottish Youth Parliament want you to do this, or you should be doing this for care experience. What would that question be? Oh. Who's first up? <laughs> if, if you don't volunteer, I just pick but you out. Be good. Yeah. Yeah? It's a hard one. Rana, Rama or Mika, Mariam, if, if mm -hmm. you get... Something, if you had the Cabinet Secretary here and you wanted to ask her a question, what would, would it you be? ask her? Maybe then I could revert back to my first question. Let the young people think about think the about answer. That, yeah, OK. <coughs> think about the answer. And I'll go back to the question about balance and rights. Maybe, Claudia, you'd maybe yeah. want to give us a, a bit of a, an answer to that one first. I would. Um, so, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for welcoming uh, Callum and I um, to what we believe is possibly... Um, the most important issue in relation to our care experience members. Um, I also want to echo, unsurprisingly, uh, what our, our allies and friends around the table have already said in relation to rights. Um, I think, Mary, uh, you're right. There is a um, peculiar experience um, which care experience children and young people face when um, they have sort of virtue to, to, to state interventions uh, to care and protect for them. I think, first of all, um, I would like to say that care experienced people are no different from children and young people across all of Scotland. They have dreams, they have had aspirations, they have talents, they have ability, um, and they have capability. They have grit, they have determination, they have hope, and they have lives that they want to lead out successfully. As an organisation, our sole mission is to see a Scotland and actually uh, to go beyond that, to see a UK, to see a Europe, to see um, an international community where care experienced people every single day experience love, equality and respect. <clears throat> and that's why the framing of human rights is so important to us. Human rights are children's rights and children's rights are human rights. And I think it's important um, for me to maybe point out what what is probably obvious, but to reiterate that, the frame through which we, as a, well, this Scottish Parliament, was set up about accountability, power sharing, um, equal opportunities, is, is all around the lens of participation, family life, freedom from degrading treatment, education, health, and an adequate standard of living. Um, most recently in the Scottish Parliament, particularly with the creation of the social security system, I'm hearing members around this table um, share consensus on how new laws that are progressive and protective should be um, put into Scottish society. Words like dignity, like citizenship, like respect, understanding um, and equality are very encouraging to hear members around this table talk about so actively. Um, and that is probably what I believe are the four found fundamental things through which we should always be assessing the standards of childhood for our care experienced people. You're right though, Mary, it is um, a <laughs> complex system and it's one which is there to protect and to keep children safe. We know that care experienced people are subject to a lot of adults um, in their life. And by virtue of that, there's a power imbalance. Um, adults that are appointed um, to look after children are there because children are needing protection. They've come from a family life which has not been to the standard um, or expectation that we would expect for, for our own children. And for me, there's two main themes through which the balance of rights, if you like, should be should be assessed. And it's usually in relation to protection and participation. Mm -hmm. When I say protection, we know that children, because of a care experience, because of their care label and because of their care identity, they face stigma, they face harassment, they face prejudice, and they face um, a high level of difference compared to non-care experience counterparts. We uh, believe 
that there needs to be more done to protect the childhood, the day-to-day -day experience of our children and young people. The impact, Mary, as you have said, uh, quite rightfully, of rights being restricted, rights being reduced, or rights disappearing altogether from those childhoods are lifelong. They are lifelong and they will last um, in the legacy of adults that have care experience. In relation to the umbrella uh, theme of participation, <clears throat> it's fundamental that care experienced children and young people feel that they are able to say what they think. Now, if you imagine how difficult that might be when you are asked to talk to someone who is effectively a stranger to you, who isn't in front of you because of blood or because of family connection, who's appointed by um, a care and protection system, and imagine doing that over and over and over again. Imagine what it feels like to feel that your voice is maybe not being heard by those people that you know are there to care and protect for to protect you. So we believe that active participation, understanding how your voice can be used, how it should be heard, um, and what redress you have when it's not been heard, is absolutely vital to care experienced children and young people in our country, feeling that they are part of their lives. Um, so we would recommend that those two lenses of protection and participation is how we assess the standard of childhoods for care experienced people in Scotland. And as Callum uh, has already highlighted, we believe that there needs to be far more conscious um, commitment from the Scottish Parliament to enhance the level of independent support through advocacy that care experienced people have access to. Those advocates are there to enable care experienced young people to say something out, the, out loud that otherwise they might not be able to say because of what I've already highlighted can be the day-to-day -day, um, situation uh, for, for a child um, or, or a young person. And I guess fundamentally we want to also see a Scotland that's the best place to grow up, but especially for children in care, especially for our children who are subject to statutory procedures, complex legal systems, and a lot of adults who have power over them in their lives. That's a standard for our society that we and our members want to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Claudia, can I just take you back to the <coughs> protection and participation? Do you think yeah. that is something, because one of the questions that we are wrestling with is that when legislation is formed here, when it's drafted, when it's at its early stages, that we would look to see an equality human rights impact assessment but an opportunities assessment, so not just about the impact, whether it complies with, with current uh, legislation, but whether it has an opportunity in it to advance some rights. Would you suggest that protection and participation would be um, a means of ensuring that assessment is done? Is that, does so that make sense? So I think the easy answer to that is yes, of course. Anything which enhances the consideration and compassion uh, which is given to care experienced children and young people will always be welcomed uh, by Who Care Scotland. I think that there's probably an additional answer to that uh, from my perspective, and that's that equalities impact assessments have had a positive benefit to um, a range of communities within our society. And right now we believe that the lens of protection which is offered through protected characteristics is something which could be extended to care experience. We believe that there's tangible experiences which are negative and have a lasting legacy um, purely because children and young people have a care label. We believe that there's a strong um, association with care experience and discrimination that has to be redressed. And we would recommend uh, that members around this table, and particularly this committee, look to utilise the powers that we think you have, not just on public bodies through corporate parenting legislation, but also through the Scotland Act, um, to enhance the levels of protection and participation, uh, wh which is offered through a protected um, characteristic um, association for care experience Th in thanks, Scotland. Thanks very much, Claudia. Now, going to Mary's other question. Is Dylan and Hannah ready with some ideas on what you would say to the Cabinet Secretary if you had one question to ask her? Well, what I've written down with help from Hannah is what are you trying to do to point blank remove inequality and discrimination of LGBTQ plus groups and why does this matter to the current school pupils and young people? I'm thinking, Mary, that the answers that, no the answers, but some of these questions would maybe form 
our uh, letter to the Cabinet yes. Secretary with some of these questions mm -hmm. in it, so we can get mm -hmm. direct answers for you. Would that, will you be yeah. happy with that? Okay. That would be good. I think we can facilitate uh, that. Um, Callum? The, the, uh, get ca Callum, I don't know if the girls are ready yet, but yeah, <laughs> Callum, go um, for it. I guess just going on from uh, Mary's question, I would ask um, for some additionality to the UNCRC. Um, I think from my own experience, I've experienced the stigma that's lifelong. I've experienced the discrimination from being declined from flats just because I'm care experienced or um, being harassed in the street uh, and weapons pulled out to me just because I was a boy who stayed in a residential home. So I've experienced the stigma and the discrimination and I have multiple examples and so does the collective of the care experience. But I think one of the, I think, um, one of the really key things that I would like to be included is what additionality will the Cabinet Secretary give in terms of creating equality and lifelong rights for young people regarding a lot of relationships we hold. Um, and I know that I'm going to use the word love. Um, it's something that's being discussed a lot just now, uh, especially in our political climate. Um, there's a lot of talk from the First Minister around it, including it in the review of the care system. And I think that I would love to live in a world where young people have the right to feel loved, to be loved, or the opportunity to give love. Um, it's quite a bold statement, but I think that everyone around this table would agree regardless that every young person should have that right to experience that. And I think that everyone around this table, I don't think many people would deny a child that right. Um, I know someone who has went through a system where there's been lots of barriers and restrictions around what's allowed. I completely understand that and I completely understand uh, the ideology and the principles of protecting both people and both young people. Um, but I think that's at a detriment to people's well-being, um, which is fundamentally one of their rights. Um, I know that I've had consequential effects of not being hugged or not being told that people feel emotive towards me, um, which has then affected me as I've got older. Uh, and I think a lot of young people, uh, um, especially our members, are speaking up and saying that this is something that's fundamentally missing. So I guess that I would ask her, would she give additionality to legislation or legislation that may be adopted, but give young people who are in state care the right to feel loved, to be loved, or to give them the opportunity to give others love um, or experience it? So. I would love to know the response from that. <laughs> we'll, we'll ask the question, you'll get a response. <laughs> and I've loved to hear your question, uh -huh, yeah. actually, because the fundamentals of any anti-discriminatory practice is that if you can find a wee bit of love in your heart for the yeah. other, yeah. where the other is yeah. always denoted as a negative thing, but if you can feel a wee bit of love for the other, then it deals with some of the discrimination and mm -hmm. the fear that leads yeah. that um, in that discrimination. I think that when we, th when we think about this is like, human rights and as a concept, everybody in the world has basic human rights. When we apply this to like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we have rights to housing, shelter, we have rights to psychological needs, we have psychological needs which are um, attachment, responsibility, um, protection, care, um, emotive sides to that. Um, so why is love not included in that? Because I think every single parent in Scotland um, would argue that young people should have the right to be loved, and I would love to sit in a committee room with those who disagreed with that. <laughs> We'd love to sit in that committee room too. <laughs> You're not sitting in that committee room today, because we, we, I think we, I could safely say we, we all agree. Um, so which, which one of the girls is going to eat? Mariam, you're going to... Oh, right, OK. Exam today, so... <laughs> Mariam's getting an exam today, so um, she needs yeah. to say this quickly and then go. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really have a question, but I think there was a question that was asked like before when we were listening to the other meeting, and it was, how do we get to people that know nothing about their rights? And I know it may seem like we're sort of repeating ourselves and saying that, um, you know, that Action for Children basically like helps them, and to be honest, it kind of does, because... If they can find people that represent them, like you know, like us, and we speak up for them, then that means that we can reach them more easily. And I think it's like it's sort of important to know that because a lot of like pupils who come from different backgrounds, they don't, they have no idea how to express themselves or their opinions, and especially like young women like us. They might come from like certain cultures that are not really educated on that matter. So I think it's important that if we were able to reach more people easily, then we can reach other people that can't basically have that right to speak. 
that's a great point. Yeah, Mary. Sana. Sana. Now, I know the Youth Parliament has their manifesto. We met mm -hmm. with you last week and yeah. you presented me with a manifesto and made me make commitments to it, which wasn't a difficult task because I was happy <laughs> to make those commitments. Yeah. So, Sana, you, you've obviously got a manifesto, you've got a drive and you've got mm -hmm. a campaign going. Do you want to tell us a wee bit about, about how you think that can help us inform the recommendations we need to make to government? Yeah. Um, so... Just choosing one question is very difficult because I have multiple there's and there's many things that still need to be done. But um, a huge, a huge part of our, our manifesto is just listening to young people. We are not listened to enough, and and we have so many opinions, so and we're so diverse, and we 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 think differently to different generations, and I think people need to to realise that and um, that we we aren't. Um, like we aren't here just for show and tell necessarily. Uh, like you can say, yeah, we listen to this one young person, but then that's one young person. My opinion's not going to be representative of all of all young person, all young people in Scotland. Um, we need to actually go out and we need to listen. So it's not just like we do it as MSYPs, but do you guys do it as MSPs? Uh, does she do it as a as a minister? It's something that we need to look at. Um, a, a good example of what. SYP did was our rights review that happened last month. We had about was it five ministers? Um, we had forty government officials. Well, 40, forty government officials and seven ministers, and it was about it was a lot of um, MSYPs that I don't know. Look at this. Twenty five MSYPs that represented like uh, the Highlands and different areas in Scotland and and so on. And we basically we consult. We consulted our young people and we brought up the biggest rights issue in our areas. So in my area, I consulted 800 young people and our biggest one was education. Um, and we said that and we had, our, we, we had our speeches and we told these government officials and we told these ministers and it's just going out there. And that was arranged by us and I feel like ministers and government officials need to arrange stuff like that and have <coughs> young people listening to what they want to do and then question them about it as well. It can't just be a one-way street. Um, so that's basically, so yes. listen to young people. Do you listen to young people is my question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Anna. We're hearing you today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Fulton, I want to go to your question, question because uh, you've got a wider question about discrimination yeah. and how, how we can tackle that. Oh, it's convenient. <clears throat> and I know that Kalida uh, has just left with one of the young people in my room, so <clears throat> it's sort of directed at that. And I tried to bring it into the last session, but I think we, we just ran out of time. And it's, I, I'm actually convener for folk who don't know if the racial equality group here at the Parliament. Uh, and last night, uh, I was at the sister group, cross party group, which is uh, tackling Islamophobia. There were speakers there at that group who are, are launching um, a, a new book, which is, which is called No Problem Here. And basically, what that book's trying to address is the, the sort of myth, if you like, that, that Scotland. Um, doesn't have a problem with racism and prejudice that, that other parts of the UK or the, the, the wider international community uh, perhaps have. And the gist of the speakers, without getting into all the details, because there was lots of stats and the speakers spoke, spoke for about an hour in total, but the gist of it was that there is a difference in the governments of devolved Scotland in terms of policy, that's of all devolved governments, and the, the UK governments of late, where, where maybe a lot of the uh, UK government have brought in sort of old empire policies, if you like. So there was that. However, public opinion is broadly similar. So what I was going to ask of the Cabinet Secretary and I wanted to put out to people is, given that, that a lot of these studies are saying that about 30% of folk in Scotland, which I find an absolutely astonishing figure, um, hold quite significant and serious um, pre prejudices, um, how can we make sure that human rights is upheld in that environment that I've just described. And I think that there was a general consensus that the government here in Scotland, um, and the parliament as a whole, actually, I should say, rather than just the government, is very positive uh, in that direction, but public opinion is broadly similar to the rest of the UK. So I, I kind of wanted to, to put that out there. And also maybe in the context of Brexit as well. Sana, would that be something you, you could uh, address? And I wonder whether um, uh, Rama and Mika would, would address the direct points as well. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be slightly on a more personal note from me because I was part of the Fair Future panel from Young Scott and we worked on 
the race equality framework for Scotland and we basically put a young person's like our recommendations to it because it was all done without consulting any young people so um, I think there's a panel about 15 of us and we basically looked at it and we we're like yeah this is this is we could tell it was put together by older people like it was it wasn't at all considering anything that a young person wanted and we looked at everything bit by bit and I was mainly at the participation and representation part because MSYP um, and um, we we were like a, a huge part of what I wanted was not necessarily role models because I know how hard it is for young people and just ethnic minority people as a whole to get into politics because we just feel like we don't have a voice and um, a huge part like my parents they just they don't really care they're just like over the head but since I got into politics I'm like okay guys you really this this does make a fundamental difference you need to research this I'm not going to tell you what to do you've got to decide yourself so I they're like but I can't be asked to do research so I do the research for them and that's how I that's how my family basically make their decisions because I tell them I'm like okay this is this this is that this is that um, but that was me personally um, if I hadn't told them to do that they wouldn't they wouldn't care um, but not everyone's going to do that. Not everyone's going to have an interest in politics, and no one's, not everyone's going to realise the effect that has on them. Before I studied modern studies, I was like, "Oh yeah, politics." Yeah. And it's not, it's not, it's not a thing that we consider in our day-to-day -day lives because we've got so many other issues. Like my, my, we, we've dealt with so much discrimination. Like my parents own a restaurant, and like when we were up and coming. So much discrimination. It's just it's unreal, especially in rural areas, because I'm from the borders and we're really small. And I think we've got like one percent ethnic minority. It's something surreal like that. And we're 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 a thumb, a sore thumb, in in a small community. So I think it's just it's intriguing their different uh, their interests and just saying, well, look, if you, uh, you your voice does count. You know, you do have an opinion, and you do have the right to be heard, and that you're—it does make a difference. It's just knowing that that you do have, you do have rights, and you do have the right, like, to express your view. Because a lot of us just we don't know that, like, we don't know that our voices are going to be heard because we'll be like, well, we're the minority. Everyone's going to overlook us. And I think it's just about say validating us and just saying, well, your voice is going to be heard, and we're going to take it to heart, and we're going to make sure that what you're saying is considered. And I think just that verification is very much needed. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, so, thanks so, Sana. <clears throat> um, can, I, can I follow up? I, don't, I think maybe uh, Rama and Mika want oh, yeah, to come course, in yeah. uh, and, and say something. Yeah, I believe that there's a lack of cultural awareness in, within schools, like holding a, a, an assembly once a year with a clip of how racism is wrong is not very effective. Well, no because that like children face racism like in schools every day and sometimes like feel like they can't even go to school because they don't want to face their bullies or they feel like they they can't speak or don't have a like a voice and i feel like groups like action for children should be placed in like every group like this heritage project that is taking place in my school gives the opportunity, like gives children the opportunity to come together and speak about their problems. And I feel like teachers as well should be more aware of like how their students are feeling within like schools because they just I kind of, I feel like they just wash it out and not many people can speak out and it's not fair. Yeah. yeah. Mikael. Yeah, following up on Rama, um, sadly, like discrimination, ignorance is still portrayed in 2018 in our schools, um, everyday life in public, and yeah, we do need people like the Action for Children, or a project, or just more awareness in general um, to young children and to adults, so they understand teenagers more because as teenagers there's also a lot going on um, in our lives already and um, with exams or school family problems and um, cultural background or whatever and um, so yeah we just really need to uh, raise awareness to um, people like me or people just 
to bring more um, thought and understanding to teenagers that might be going through this every single day. And um, as Rama said, not just once a year in assembly, sitting there just for 15 minutes talking about this situation that people have to face every single day. And people are scared and people really want to speak out and really want to be heard and have a voice about these things. So um, we really need to just bring a lot more awareness to the, this type of thing. OK. Felton, if you want to come back in quickly, because I want to get Annie in with <coughs> her question on training yeah, to some yeah. of the organisations that are here. Yeah, I appreciate it. We're, we're run, running out of time, I really. Uh, I think the answers were, were, were absolutely fantastic. I just wondered if the, the people had answered think that the government's on the right track and, and what more um, it, it can do, because some of the stats that were revealed last night at, 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 that, um, at, at the meeting that was at, for example, um, you know, a, a, a large proportion of people don't feel that um, uh, you can be Scottish, you can be considered Scottish unless you either have white skin colour or uh, a Scottish accent. And the, the stats were something 30 odd percent, as I said earlier, were in that category, which I just found <coughs> um, astonishing. But so I, I suppose it's the right to be Scottish, the right to be part of this, this country. So um, I might not have time to go through a full answer, but okay. it through yourself. I wonder okay. if people think okay. the government are on the, the right track. Okay. Yeah. As being Scottish, being brought up in Edinburgh, um, meeting new people, I still get asked, oh, where are you from? If I say I'm from Scotland, they go, oh, where are you actually from? Or, you know, even people getting brought up in Scotland, they get asked this question just because they're not white or they don't, as he said, have an accent, which is um, kind of not disturbing, but it's just not nice to hear that um, you can't understand people that have different skin tones, have different cultural backgrounds that can be from Scotland, even if they're not white. And um, I think the government just need to um, bring more awareness with that and to show people that there are, as you said, people that are different and people that are from Scotland and not just because they're white, um, but because that's where they come from. And um, yeah. Straight to the point, absolutely straight to the point. That, that, thanks very much. Sana. Yeah, um, mm. uh, uh, like as soon as you said that in Scotland and being white, like uh, one thing popped in my mind when I was originally elected as MSYP, I was over the moon excited but one comment originally got me down now, I'll just use it as evidence of discrimination, um, is that some people just said, why is she MSYP? Because she's not truly Scottish. And I was born and raised in Scotland and I've got a really strong national identity. But um, that, that comment initially like, hit me, I was just like, oh. And that was people in my school and people I've known and for a very long time. Um, and like I was like, why, why wouldn't I be Scottish just because of the colour of my skin? Like, yes, my parents are Pakistani. I, I, like, I love being like Pakistani as well, but I, I identify as Scottish. Uh, Scottish, Pakistani, Scotland comes first because I, this is where I, this is what I know. I don't even know any other language than English. Um, so, uh, like, that initial, like, racism, which now I'm just like, I, I, I talked to that person that said it, and I said, why did you say that? And if they said, it's because it's funny. And I was like, eh, but is it really? Um, so I, I talked to them. Now they've changed their mind. They thought, yeah, you're Scottish. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> but a lot of what people do, a lot of discrimination is mainly because people think it's what their friends want them to say or they think it's yeah. comedy or they, they think it's, it's, it's not going to hurt and it does hurt and it's just trying to relay that message. But it's really hard to stand up and say, that hurt me. Yeah. Because people will be like, oh, ha, so she's getting hurt by that. I'm going to hurt her even more because I think it's funny again. Um, but yeah, just thought I'd bring Th that. Thanks, Anna. I think it's been incredibly important to hear the voices of young people today. And I know lots of members have to get in, in with their questions and we're, we're right out of time. It, Annie's got a question on training, I think, maybe to the two organisations about yeah. how, how we do that very, very quickly. Yeah, just very quickly. Some Sorry, of you Annie. have heard <laughs> earlier um, the question I put to Cabinet Secretary, and 
I think the thing is, there's a balance of rights. So we've got core fundamental rights and we've got others. And as parliamentarians, we need to make sure that we're looking at everyone's human rights. Would it be that every parliamentarian gets goes through human rights training? Do we look at a rapporteur on each committee? Or how do we do that? Because for me, I find it could be quite challenging. I think it's it's mainly judicial stuff that goes with it. But as, as us to be leaders, we need to know what we're doing. Lucinda, do you think we need to be a rights respect in Parliament? I do. I do. And we've actually talked to the Deputy First Minister about it nine months ago about doing child rights training. Mm -hmm. And it could be similar to the work that we do in schools, but I think it's absolutely... I think everybody should do it, absolutely. I think mm -hmm. everybody needs to be aware... Obviously, I'm referring to children's rights, yes. but because that's what we do. I, I would absolutely support that. And I think it's something we should really focus on. Juliet, you're, 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 I'm going to bring you in next, and then, Chelsea, you're getting the last word. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, I would agree. I think every parliamentarian should have training on um, children's human rights, on human rights more generally. Um, I think there should be a special rapporteur as well, and I suggested earlier about the interparliamentary group. Um, I also think that um, Parliament needs to have um, more training and awareness of some of the mechanisms that are in place, and so the fact that we've got the Children and Young People Act that um, places the requirement to consider um, on ministers to consider the UNCRC. Um, the Scottish Government is now using child rights and wellbeing impact assessments, and I think that MSPs need to have support and need to have the training to actually examine those impact assessments properly to make sure that they're being, they're being done um, effectively. And so I think there's a whole range from the basics of children's human rights through to the international legal system, but also through to what's happening domestically and how you can hold government to account. Okay, thanks. Chelsea. Um, yeah, I just wanted to touch quickly on issues that were brought up earlier um, about making rights real and by about rights being something for people elsewhere. And that's something that we hear most often from children is that when they're taught about rights, it's something that happens to children elsewhere around the world. And so it's not about rights being real here in Scotland. Um, and so I think while it's important to raise understanding and awareness of rights, it's also important that children here are experiencing their rights. And that's something I think we can task all adults with. It's our responsibility as duty bearers to make sure that children in Scotland are experiencing their rights. Um, and I think as these conversations around adverse childhood experiences, around the care system, around discrimination take place, I think we need to explicitly link those to children's rights or human rights more broadly, and also around the issues of human dignity, because I think that's really important. A good point to finish. <laughs> now, you would have realised that we could have sat with you for hours today to hear from you, uh, but parliamentary protocol means that I need to finish this committee. I should have finished it a minute ago, uh, but you know we, need to, we needed to hear from everyone this morning. If you go away and you feel you've not been able to tell us something that you wanted to tell us, please, through the, the people that are supporting you, uh, tell us. Be because, as I said earlier, this, this inquiry is running for another few weeks, and there's much information as we can put in that in order to make our recommendations to, to government and the parliament and how we move the whole, you know, the Scottish parliament being that human rights guarantor, not just for us, but for everybody, and including young people, is incredibly important. So your evidence to that is incredibly important. Um, our very deep, grateful thanks to you all today for your evidence. I think you've all done absolutely brilliantly. You've told us exactly what we need to hear uh, and we've heard it uh, and we hope we will reflect that in our report. But you can come back and tell us if we haven't because we will not be leaving this issue to, to lie after the report's published. We'll be continuing on uh, uh, for the whole um, mandate of this parliament 2021. Um, so we'll be keen to hear from you. But thank you so much uh, for your evidence this morning. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And I'm going to suspend committee uh, and, and we will be back, back together uh, next week. Thank you.